Sitting in prison gives you a lot of time to reflect on your own stupidity. However, I wasn't reflecting on anything but hate. I was focused on hating my boss, my soon-to-be ex-wife Carol, and hating myself for being so damn stupid. My name is Michael Arnold. And when I say I was stupid, I mean stupid with a capital S. I was stupid like a husband who didn't know his wife was cheating on him. And she was cheating on him with the person I hated most in my life, my boss, Jacob Sanders. I was also stupid because I didn't know that this cheating wife was pregnant with his child. Stupid me thought the baby was mine. I think my wife's pregnancy is what prompted me to say, Honey, we need to talk. I suppose I should step back a little bit and explain a little bit. Oddly enough, my current problem started back in first grade. I first got to know and eventually hate Jacob Sanders when we went to first grade together. We became enemies ever since he made fun of my freckles. It was the first of many fights. It ended in a draw when the teacher broke us up. I had a bloody nose and he had a black eye. For the first eight years of school, Jacob and I fought an average of three times a year, with third grade being the worst. We had seven fights. In eighth grade, however, we only had one, and that was for good reason. I beat the crap out of him. I wanted nothing to do with Jacob and tried to stay away from him, but he wouldn't leave me alone. For some reason, he was jealous of me and was always trying to outdo me. He tried to get better grades than me in each of our classes. He was better in science and literature. I was better in math and history. In other subjects, we were about the same. In sports, Jacob was a pretty good athlete, but I was a little better. However, if I played a sport, Jacob played the same sport and tried to outdo me. The fighting stopped, like I said, after 8th grade when Jacob realized he couldn't beat me. That's when he started trying to embarrass me or get me in trouble. He almost got me expelled and arrested while we were in school. It happened in my sophomore year when someone broke into the school and spray-painted graffiti in the hallways. The authorities found my student ID next to an empty spray can in a trash can. The only thing that saved me was that I had noticed my ID missing from my wallet the day before and reported it. I knew it had to be Jacob because one day when I was getting out of the shower, I saw him walking away from my locker after practice. I figured he was up to something bad so I checked everything in my locker. When I got to my wallet, I checked the cash first and then started going through the rest. That's when I noticed my ID was missing. I immediately went to the administration office and reported it. One day, Jacob had a fart noisemaker. He put the device on the desk where I was sitting and turned it on. The sound of farting echoed around the classroom, and then Jacob started holding his nose and waving his hand. Mike, what did you have for lunch? He chuckled. The class laughed, but I used the good old saying. He who smells it takes it. The class burst into laughter again, and then Miss Wormwood warned us that if Jacob and I continued to disrupt the class, we would spend time in detention. The fact that the teacher laughed at us and then reprimanded us made Jacob furious. He blushed brightly but said nothing. Besides the fact that Jacob was trying to get me expelled and maybe even arrested, his attempts were more annoying than anything else. Basically, I didn't care that he was better than me. Barring the usual teenage insecurities, I was quite comfortable with who I was. However, there was one area that I did care about, and that was girls. We were both pretty good looking. Jacob's family was wealthy though, which gave him an advantage over the girls at school. In 11th grade, he got his own car, and it wasn't an old wreck. His parents bought him a $50,000 BMW Z4. How could I compete with him? As it turned out, I was cute enough to get my share of dates. Jacob, on the other hand, dated cheerleaders and girls from the in crowd. I figured they were out of my league anyway, so I didn't care. However, he wasn't satisfied with his resounding success with the girls. He needed to try to rub my nose in his success. If I dated a girl more than once, Jacob would immediately pounce on me and start dating her. And it didn't take long until she dumped me. But even there, for the most part, I didn't care. I wasn't dating any of the girls, so if they wanted to date Jacob, I didn't care. But there was one girl I really liked. Her name was Sandy Springer, and she was smart, funny, and beautiful. So when I started dating her, I took her to places that were hard to reach so Jacob wouldn't find out about my interest. After a few months of getting to know each other, we decided to date. I thought that if Sandy was wearing my cool ring, I was safe. Remember when I said I was stupid? I was stupid then too. The prom was approaching, and I decided that Sandy and I would go together. I should have asked her right away, but I wasn't sure it would have done any good. Anyway, after buying the tickets, I mentioned it to Sandy at lunch. She blushed and said she had accepted an invitation from Jacob to go with him. I demanded and got my ring back. 
Then I left Sandy sobbing in the cafeteria. I never spoke to her again. I was so mad at Sandy I wanted to rip someone's head off. Instead, I saw Pam Taylor, the captain of the cheerleading squad and Jacob's supposed girlfriend. Under normal circumstances, I would never have dared approach her. Hi, Pam, I said cheerfully. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. How about you, Michael? She replied. Pam was gorgeous, but not arrogant. I'm fine, I said, deciding I had nothing to lose. Say, don't you want to go to the prom with me? That's very nice of you, she replied kindly, but I'll go with Jacob. Oh, I feigned ignorance. I must have misunderstood, because I just heard Jacob ask Sandy Springer. I must have misunderstood. Yeah, forget what I said. I'm sure I misheard. I walked away, leaving Pam agitated and talking to herself. I found out later that she and Jacob had had a big fight. He may have stolen Sandy from me, but I had ruined his romance with Pam. It wasn't completely satisfying, but it was better than nothing. But later that afternoon, things got much better. Michael, Pam called out to me as I walked out of the school. Hi, Pam, I continued to feign innocence. I'm sorry I upset you earlier. Cut the crap, Michael, Pam narrowed her eyes. I found out you were dating Sandy and that creep Jacob stole your girlfriend. My ears were burning red. I was being pulled apart. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just trying to get back at Jacob. I'm sorry you got caught in the crossfire. Were you serious about asking me to the ball? Bears, I began. Never mind. Yes, I shall be very glad if I can escort you to the ball. Good, because I want payback, Pam said. And if you play your cards right, this could be a very memorable night. Prom was a real highlight for me. Not only did I ask the prettiest girl in school to prom, but I made her feel like a prince. Pam was head over heels in love with me. I enjoyed the look on the other guys' faces. They couldn't believe she was there with me. And Jacob, I don't know what he thought was going to happen, but it certainly wasn't his girlfriend's date with me. I think Jacob thought Pam might go to the prom as a date for one of the soccer players, but certainly not with me. His eyes almost popped out of his head when he saw us enter the auditorium. Throughout the evening, he tried to get between me and Pam. He tried to get her to leave me and sit at his table. Pam blew him off. He asked her to dance many times, but Pam wouldn't give him the time of day. I felt sorry for Sandy because she realized that Jacob was using her. Eventually, Sandy cried and asked her parents to take her away. I still feel a little bad about it now, but she made her choice and has to live with it. After the ball, Jacob was still trying to get Pam away from me. I was smart enough to realize that I was playing Cinderella. And by tomorrow, Pam would probably be back with Jacob. But today, I was going to play my part to the fullest. And that led me to the local motel, where I made love to the prettiest girl in school. When I dropped Pam off, she gave me a big kiss and told me what a great guy I was. I headed home, floating on a cloud. But as I expected, by the following Monday, Pam and Jacob were a couple again. But I still smirked at Jacob as we passed in the hallway. It was graduation, and most of us had left for our respective colleges. I was sad to leave my hometown and scared of the unknown, but I wasn't sorry to be leaving Jacob for good. At least I didn't think I was. I had been accepted to Georgia Institute of Technology, and Jacob was going to Harvard. Of course he was going to Harvard. A building was named after his grandfather there. I was doing well at Georgia Institute of Technology, majoring in software engineering. And it was at a party during my junior year that I met Carol. I won't bore you with the details of how we courted, fell in love, and got married. Truth be told, I think we were more like good friends in the beginning than truly in love. Needless to say, our story wasn't all that memorable, and it doesn't really matter now. What I will say about Carol is this. She was smart. She studied business at the University of Georgia. I liked her because she was not only smart, but she was fun and very friendly. However, Carol was not super pretty. She was cute, like the girl from the neighbor's yard. Truth be told, Carol couldn't compare to Pam but she was about as pretty as Sandy. For some reason, she and I hit it off. We were married three months after graduating from university, and for the entire five years of our marriage, I considered us quite happy. Although we were friends rather than lovers at the time of our marriage, by the third year of our union, I was completely in love with Carol, and I believe she was also in love with me. We even talked about starting a family. I didn't realize that my wife had already started one without me. Right after high school, I got a job at Zaba Security Software, 
a small startup company. I graduated top of my class, so I had my pick of jobs. The two brothers at Zaba hoodwinked me, assuring me that I would be on the first floor and make a fortune. However, don't get me wrong, things were going very well for the company. The firm was thriving, and we were doing quality work for some very large companies. I was also being paid a tidy six-figure salary. Our job was to find security holes in the company's software and plug them. Our reputation was growing, but then the brothers decided to get out. To my surprise, we were acquired by a firm about the same size as Zaba, and that's when my problems began. About three years after I started working at Zaba, Carol wanted to find a new job. It just so happened that Zaba was looking for an office manager. Carol applied and was hired. I was a little nervous because we both worked for the same company, but things went well at first. We would carpool and eat lunch together. We worked in completely different departments and areas, so we rarely saw each other during the day. We would drive to work together, kiss and go to our respective departments. If we were both free, which was most days, we would have lunch together and then go home at the end of the day. Everything was fine until it all fell apart. Before I tell you about the acquisition, let me tell you about my department. I was a senior programmer, which meant that I worked on projects myself and kept track of the schedules of the other eight programmers who reported to me. But my main responsibility was to troubleshoot any problems that my team couldn't handle on their own. Fortunately, they were few and far between, which meant that our clients were very satisfied. Our workspace was the size of half a basketball court. We called it the bullpen and worked mostly at standing desks. The room was filled with all sorts of computers, servers, interfaces, and printers. We had just about every piece of computer equipment you could ever want. We prided ourselves on making our clients' systems as secure as possible. In my five years with the company, we had only one complaint about a client's system being hacked. But we traced the hack to the fault of one of the company's employees. He had disabled most of the software we had installed. The employee wasn't very smart, but he gave us a sleepless night. In addition to the nine of us, we had an administrative assistant, Kimberly. She was like our girl Friday. She prepared any correspondence or memos we needed. She kept track of supplies and made sure we didn't run out of anything. Kimberly also prepared our monthly reports and kept track of hours worked. Oddly enough, most of our work at first was done with pencil and paper. This allowed the programmer to get a general idea before he or she started typing anything into the computer. Somehow Kimberly was able to decipher everyone's handwriting and typed notes for our files. And even though it wasn't part of her job description, Kimberly made damn good coffee for us every morning. Kimberly was about 23 or 4 years old, I believe. She had short blonde hair, deep hazel eyes, and a very pretty face, but she weighed about 50 pounds. Considering Kimberly was only 5 feet 5 inches tall, that was a lot of weight for her. Even though she had a beautiful face, her large belly and butt immediately ruined the image. I knew Kimberly was very concerned about her weight because she was always talking about how fat she was. I cringed every time she did it, but realized it was just her defense mechanism. All I cared about was that Kimberly was damn good at her job and was a valued member of my team. The fact that Zaba was acquired came out of the blue. The Zaba brothers didn't even have the courage to personally inform the employees. They had their attorney make the announcement. I was furious because all the stock options that the brothers had promised when they went public went for naught with this announcement. Besides, I didn't know what to do with this change. Carol was as upset and confused by the news as I was, but she was the one who convinced me to stay the course until we saw what the new owners would do. They sent a senior vice president to oversee the transition. At first, he focused on the main office. At the time I joined the firm, Zaba had grown from five employees to over 150. From what I heard, the man from the new headquarters was going to start in the accounting department. Then he was going to work his way up through the entire company. Not two days later, I learned that the vice president of review for Zaba Security Software was none other than Jacob Sanders. At the same time, however, I learned that Jacob was leading the transition. I also learned that in order to bring our salaries in line with the parent company, my salary would be increased by $35,000 and Carol's by $15,000. My internal alarm told me to run rather than walk to the nearest exit. However, Carol convinced me that we would be foolish to quit our current jobs, especially after the pay raise. Besides, she pointed out, Jacob wouldn't be there more than six months, and then he'd be gone. The first change came when four new programmers were hired and assigned to the bullpen. Sure, they were all Harvard people, but none of them were even a tenth better than anyone on my existing team. Not only were they not the best programmers, 
but they were also characterized by arrogance and a sense of entitlement. The four of them immediately began harassing Kimberly. Sometimes it was sexual harassment, and sometimes it was just plain meanness. I tried to convince them and point out that their behavior was unacceptable. However, they didn't stop. Instead, they just harassed Kimberly when they thought I wasn't around. I finally called all four of them into the conference room and gave them a requiem prayer. They obeyed me, but I realized they weren't going to stop. Besides harassing Kimberly, all four of them were a pain in the ass. No one on my team liked them, and they did more harm than good when it came to their jobs. Eventually, I decided I wanted them gone. Unfortunately, I didn't have the authority to fire them because Jacob had hired them. I knew that if I demanded that he fire them, Jacob would just ignore me. I knew Kimberly came in early every day to make coffee and get the office ready. Ever since I'd whipped the four assholes for their treatment of Kimberly, I'd noticed that they'd all started coming in early. Eventually, I guessed that they were using the time before I arrived to torture the poor girl. I knew that Kimberly had gotten to the point where she was going to quit. I also knew that she liked working at Zaba's and needed the job. So I decided to get there early and catch them doing it. Hiding in the supply closet next to our small kitchen, I kept my cell phone at the ready. Just as I expected, Kimberly came in and started making coffee. A few minutes later, the four of them arrived, and the agony began. Hey, Balloon! Ted, the ringleader, smirked, turning to Kimberly. Show us what you can do. Yes, said the other two. We'll even help you. I saw the tears rolling down Kimberly's face, and I couldn't take it anymore. I had more than enough evidence, so I stepped out of the closet. You four, gather your things and leave. You guys are done. You have no right to fire us, Fred replied. Mr. Sanders hired us, and he said he's the only one who can fire us. That's true, I said with a nasty smile on my face. However, I have evidence that you sexually assaulted Kimberly. So, let me explain what your options are. The four of you can either resign immediately, or I will turn this video over to the police. So the choice is yours. Either you resign or I call the police. I'll give you 15 minutes to make a decision. You can even run to Jacob if you want, but I'm sure he's not going to put his ass on the line to protect you scumbags. 15 minutes later, I received all four resignations and all four left. Kimberly's expression was one of complete relief and gratitude. Kimberly, I called her over to my desk when all four had left. I apologize for what those four put you through. I should have acted sooner. If anything like this happens again, promise me you'll come to me right away. You are a wonderful person and these four are just assholes. Kimberly sobbed and thanked me for protecting her. I told her it was part of my job, but I didn't do a very good job because she had to suffer too long at the hands of those assholes. Mr. Arnold, you don't know how much this means to me, she said, barely holding back tears. I was going to quit, but I didn't know what I would do without this job. I didn't know if I could find another job as good as this one. Again, Kimberly, I'm sorry you had to put up with that garbage. I can see that you are upset. If you want to take the day off, I'll make sure it doesn't count against your personal days or sick leave. Thank you, Mr. Arnold, but I'd rather be here at work. After that day, it seemed like Kimberly couldn't do enough for me. I tried to tell her that I was just doing my job, and I kept insisting that I wasn't doing my job well because of what she had been through. Of course, I was called into Jacob's office as soon as he found out that I had gotten his programmers to quit. I want those programmers rehired, he demanded as soon as I crossed the threshold of his office. That's not going to happen, I said firmly. I have proof that those four assholes sexually assaulted and abused an administrative assistant in our department. If you want to hire them back, go ahead. But I can guarantee there will be a lawsuit filed against all four of them, the parent company and you. I don't think your bosses will think too highly of it. Jacob glared at me, but then smiled and relented. He tried to pretend he didn't know all the details. But that night I realized he was lying. Carol came home and lashed out at me for acting like an asshole with Jacob. She thought I was an asshole for threatening our boss. At that point, I should have known what Jacob was up to because my gut was screaming, danger. But when things got back to normal at home, I brushed the incident aside. After all, I still believed that Carol loved me and only me. If I had listened to my intuition, maybe I wouldn't be in jail right now. But I was foolish and let Jacob and my wife lull me into a false sense of well-being. And for two months after the merger, nothing changed between Carol and me. 
I learned that the company that acquired us was called Unity Software. They were about the same size as us, but worked mostly on government contracts. Zaba gave them the opportunity to enter the commercial market. And no, Jacob's father didn't own the company. His family had made a fortune in pipe and wire manufacturing. However, Jacob's father sold the business when Jacob was still in college. I could say a lot of unpleasant things about Jacob, but I couldn't call him incompetent. In fact, he did an excellent job of merging the two companies. Moreover, he convinced the board of directors to keep the Zaba name because it had a better reputation. I didn't realize that Jacob finished the job of merging the two companies in eight weeks. After that, he set about seducing my gullible wife. Like Sandy in high school, Jacob managed to win Carol over. Despite my warnings about him, Carol seemed to be enamored with the asshole and constantly talked about what a great job he was doing. I kept warning her about Jacob, but she just said I was jealous. In the fourth month, Carol announced that she was pregnant. I was over the moon. However, our sex life went downhill. It went from three times a week to once every two weeks. I attributed it to Carol's pregnancy. Then our lunches together stopped, and finally Carol stopped traveling with me to work. All of this culminated in the talk. One morning, Carol stopped me before leaving for work. I was a little surprised to find that she was still home, since lately she had been leaving at least an hour before me. Michael, we need to talk, she said, inviting me to take a seat on the couch. I sat down as requested, not realizing what was so important we had to discuss so early in the morning. What Carol said to me, however, blew my whole world up. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, Carol said with hardness in her eyes, but I fell in love with Jacob and he fell in love with me. I looked at her for a long time. I studied her face and realized she wasn't sorry for anything. Finally, I exploded. Are you out of your mind? I told you Jacob is an asshole and he's going to try to drive a wedge between us. I can't believe you believe his complete bullshit. He's not an asshole, burst out Carol. He's a kind and loving man. He understands me in a way you never have. I could feel my soul crumbling with every word Carol said. I was desperate at this point, so I chose something that I hoped would bring her to her senses. What about our unborn child? I said softly. Doesn't that mean anything to you? The baby's not yours, Carol said with a strained smile. I was stunned by her statement. That's a lie. No, it's not, she said. We hadn't had sex for two weeks when I got pregnant. Now I was beyond furious. You cheating whore. You had fun with that piece of shit. It's my body and I can do whatever I want with it. She shouted at me. You don't own me. Devastated is not all there is to say about how I feel. But my father once advised me never to show a woman that she hurt you. Keeping my composure was the hardest thing I've ever had to do but I managed to pull myself together and smirked at her. You said Jacob understands you in a way I never did, I said with a strained laugh. You're right, he does understand. He understands that you're a stupid, gullible twit. God, you're so stupid. But you know what? You deserve each other. He's a goddamn asshole and you're a goddamn whore. Screw you, Michael, exploded Carol. No, that's not going to happen again, I said calmly. But just so you know, I'm not moving out of this house. You can live with Jacob in his apartment. We'll see about that. Carol turned and headed for the bedroom. What a goddamn nightmare I've gotten myself into. Finding out that my beloved wife had been having fun with Jacob all this time was too much to bear. I wanted to beat the shit out of her, but I just didn't have the strength to do it to her. She is a woman after all. Jacob, on the other hand, didn't give me any doubts. I cried all the way to work, but I finally pulled myself together. It's a pure lie. I was running from pure rage. Along the way, I decided I would resign myself to beating the shit out of Jacob, but not necessarily in that order. I bumped into Jacob as he walked through the front door of the company. He didn't seem the least bit alarmed to see me, and he even grinned. The thought flashed through my mind that it would have been a lot like Carol if she'd taken the liberty of dropping her little bombshell on me without consulting Jacob. She was very independent. On the other hand, Jacob, I suspected, wasn't going to tell me about the baby until it was born. Then he would take both my wife and the newly born baby away from me at the same time. That would be his final victory over me. Fury swept over me as I approached him. He continued to smirk. 
At that moment, I exploded and punched him in the nose with my fist and then in the mouth. And when he started to crumble, I hit him with an uppercut. I left him curled up in front of the door as the guards rushed in to help. I later learned that in addition to a broken nose, he had lost three teeth. I was not unharmed either. Two fingers on my left hand were broken. I headed to the cafeteria and started gathering all my personal belongings and papers. Kimberly saw me, and there was worry and fear on her face. What's wrong? She asked with genuine concern. Jacob has been entertaining my wife behind my back, and now she's leaving me for him. I just beat the crap out of him, so I guess I'm fired. And even if they don't fire me, I'm out. The rest of the staff were shocked to hear what had happened. My team was not only upset for me, but also very worried about their jobs. I assured them that my action would not affect their future work in any way. After calming down the staff and assuring them that they would not be harmed by my stupidity, I went back to packing. But no sooner had I finished than the police arrived and I was arrested. I assumed this would be my fate, but I didn't expect it to happen so soon. While I was being handcuffed, I asked Kimberly if she would pack up the rest of my things and take them home with her. After I was photographed, fingerprinted, and given paper towels to wipe my fingers, I was allowed to make a phone call. But I didn't know who to call. My parents were on a cruise. Plus, they lived 2,000 miles away in San Diego, and I lived in Nashville. I certainly wasn't going to call Carol. I finally decided to call Kimberly. Maybe she could get me a lawyer. When I called Zaba, however, the receptionist told me that Kimberly was gone for the day. After that, I didn't know what to do and just sat in my cell, alternately mad as hell and wondering how I could get my wife back. One thought kept running through my head. How could Carol betray me in such a cold and heartless way? Then the thought of revenge overshadowed everything else. As the day wore on and I languished in jail, I began to realize that Jacob already had a plan. My problems were just beginning. I know that Jacob didn't expect the kind of beating that he got today. However, I was sure that Jacob expected me to attack him as soon as I found out about his betrayal. Only he figured he could do it at a convenient time and place. I seemed to have ruined that part of his plan. At about four o'clock in the afternoon, I appeared before the judge for arraignment. I was assigned a public defender since I did not have a lawyer. To my dismay, he looked like a teenager with a bad complexion. Not only did my attorney look like a child, but he didn't seem to know anything about me or my case. He was quickly trying to read the case when the judge started to annoy him. Counselor, the judge bellowed, it's very simple. Will your client plead guilty or not guilty? The guy looked at me like a deer at a headlight. Then I jumped up and firmly declared, not guilty. Thank God, sighed the judge. Bail is set at $2,500, cash or check. I did not have enough cash with me and I did not carry blank checks with me. So I turned to the judge. I'm sorry, your honor, but I don't have that much cash and I don't carry blank checks. Is there any way I can contact the bail bondsman? My secretary will help you with that and she'll let you know when your court date is set, he said. But before he could name the next case, I heard a voice behind me. I'll bail him out. As I turned around, I saw Kimberly waving her checkbook. I was stunned to see her in the courtroom and very touched that she cared enough to come and help me. I'll pay you back as soon as I can get to an ATM, I assured Kimberly. I'm not worried about it, she said softly, looking at my swollen arm. Does it hurt a lot? In the overall scheme of things, it doesn't even compare to the pain of Carol's betrayal. If anything, boss, Kimberly said, looking me in the eye, I think your wife is a very stupid bitch. She made a huge mistake trading you for Jacob. I smiled at my administrative assistant. Thank you, that's very kind of you. At that moment, a young man appeared in front of me. Are you Michael Arnold? When I answered, yes, he handed me an envelope and said, you have been served. I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but the speed with which I was handed the papers left no doubt that Jacob and Carol had been planning this for a long time. It was another cut in my heart. Let's grab a bite to eat after I withdraw some money from the ATM. I said dejectedly. However, when I tried to access my account, I was denied. I called the bank and was told that all my accounts have been frozen. It will remain in effect until it is lifted by the court. Yes, I now know that it is possible to petition the court for relief from the total asset freeze. But I didn't know that at the time. I also learned that my other savings account had been frozen and my credit cards canceled. 
A quick examination of my wallet showed that I had $126 plus a $100 bill tucked into one of the folds. Apparently, Carol and Jacob have frozen all my money, I informed Kimberly. I don't know what I'm going to do, but at least I'll be able to buy you dinner. No, you're not, Kimberly protested. You're coming to my house and I'll make dinner for us. I have to admit that Kimberly's suggestion appealed to me. It didn't make sense for me to spend what little money I had on dining out. We pulled into Zaba's, picked up my car, and I followed Kimberly to her apartment. I couldn't believe how helpful this woman was to me. After all, she was just a co-worker. I was going to pay her back every cent and more as soon as I got my finances straightened out. At dinner, I started to feel really bad. Not only that, but two of my fingers hurt like hell. I'd put ice on them as soon as I got to Kimberly's, but they still hurt. After watching me squirm in pain, Kimberly finally pulled out a bottle of Percocet, which she had bought for root canal treatment. I took one pill, and within half an hour the pain was greatly reduced. Still, I was not good company. They really did a number on me, I lamented. I'm totally screwed, taped up, and tattooed. Right now I can't even think about getting back at Jacob or Carol because it'll boomerang back at me. But someday I'll pay those two bastards back in full. Mr. Arnold, Kimberly said softly. Please call me Michael, I insisted. I'm not your boss anymore. Besides, what you did for me today makes you a very good friend. Kimberly smiled and continued. Michael, my mother cheated on my father and left him for another man. I had to live with her and I hated every minute of it. Her lover was an asshole just like Jacob. He never married my mother, but they lived together for 10 years until he found someone younger and ran away. My father was embittered and for years he tried to get revenge on my mother. He went to prison several times and eventually died a broken man. Don't waste your life trying to get revenge. My father eventually told me that he was truly sorry for letting my mother's betrayal ruin him. He wished he could just move on with his life and forget that bitch. Today, my mother lives alone in a nursing home where she has breathing problems due to years of smoking. I visit her once a week, even though I still don't like her very much. And every week I have to listen to her lament about what a mistake she made leaving my father. So please don't waste your life getting revenge. I told her she was probably right. However, at that moment, I wasn't about to let those treacherous bastards off the hook. Anger was still bubbling in the back of my mind, and I wanted my piece of flesh. After I helped put the dishes away, I told Kimberly that it was time for me to head out to find a cheap motel. Her response was immediate. No, you're not doing that. You're going to spend the night here. I have a spare bedroom and I'll be glad to have you. Kimberly, you were the only ray of sunshine in the pit that became my life. I can't impose on you anymore. First of all, it's not an imposition, she insisted. Second, if you sleep here, I can go to work tomorrow and find out what's going on. Again, Kimberly sounded much more reasonable than I did, so I accepted her invitation. About mid-morning the next day, Kimberly called me to inform me that I had indeed been laid off. She then told me to turn on my computer and type up a letter instructing the HR department to send my last check to her address. Shirley, the head of HR, wasn't sure if the company was obligated to pay my vacation and sick pay. But she thought it should be mentioned in the letter anyway. But the courts have frozen all my money, I remarked. Shirley told me that the court order only applies to bank accounts. So send the letter as soon as possible before Jacob or Carol realize what you're doing. I did as Kimberly suggested and received a fax backstating that I would be receiving a check in a couple of days in the amount of $4,925.57. The fax also said that they should check state law to determine if the company had to pay for vacation or sick pay. As it turns out, they don't. Nevertheless, getting almost 5000 was very welcome. When Kimberly got home, she told me that Jacob wasn't there that day, but Carol was, and she was mad at me for ruining her boyfriend's life. Somehow that amused both Kimberly and me. I decided to stay at Kimberly's until I got my check. During that time, I put together a resume and started actively looking for a job. Very quickly, I discovered that Jacob and Carol had blacklisted me, since I worked in cybersecurity, no one would be looking for me with a felony conviction. When the check arrived, I gave it to Kimberly and she transferred the money to her account. I didn't want to risk opening a new account and then freezing it too. When I told Kimberly again that I was going to get rid of her worries and rent my own apartment, she got upset. Kimberly pointed out that without a checking account, I probably couldn't even rent a doghouse. 
Besides, if they checked my credit rating now, it would probably show my financial difficulties. Look, please stay here until you find a new job, she convinced me. In the meantime, you can get a lawyer. Eventually, I agreed. The attorney I hired took me on when I paid him an upfront fee of $2,000. It was money well spent, however, because he immediately filed a motion with the court to allow me access to a reasonable amount of money from our checking and savings accounts. The court allowed me to spend an amount sufficient to provide a minimal lifestyle. This, of course, included attorney's fees. I had been in Kimberly's apartment for eight days and decided it was time to leave. So I found an apartment in her complex and put down the required deposit. That Saturday, Kimberly helped me buy a minimal set of furniture for my new place. I also took her out to dinner, which I had promised her. Kimberly wanted to go to the Olive Garden, which I also like. During the meal, I studied her more closely. She had an angelic face, but the extra 50 pounds she carried detracted from that beauty. And I could tell that Kimberly was very self-conscious about her weight. Then an idea occurred to me that I hoped she wouldn't find offensive. I ran it through my head deciding how best to present the proposal. I just found out that our complex has a gym, I said carelessly. I'd like to use it, but I'd really like someone to go with. Would you be interested? Do you really want to be seen with me? She asked, running her hands down her sides, pointing out her extra weight. Yes, I would, I replied readily unless you don't want to be seen with a potential criminal. My comment elicited exactly the reaction I wanted. Kimberly really didn't want to go to the gym because she didn't want anyone to see her body. However, Kimberly did not want to offend me at all. So she went along with it. We made a schedule where we went four times a week at six in the morning because there was never anyone there. After the first week, Kimberly realized that she didn't have to worry about being embarrassed and began to enjoy the sessions. I kept looking for a job, but no one in the security software industry showed any interest in me. At least not until my case was heard. In talking to my lawyer, I found out that there was a good chance that I would be found guilty of assault. Still, he was cautious. He didn't tell me what to say or what to lie about. However, he did tell me that if I went into a blind rage over the infidelity of my boss and wife, that could be a mitigating factor. And if I couldn't remember what really happened, the court would certainly have to take that into account as well. On the day of the trial, Kimberly took off work and came with me. I really appreciated that kind of support. When my attorney learned that Judge Parker would be presiding over the trial, he convinced me to ask for a bench trial. In this case, the judge, not the jury, would make the decision. My lawyer explained that this would make the judge happy, and besides, Judge Parker hates crooks. The prosecutor presented three witnesses to the alleged attack. They told what they had seen and heard. My attorney cross-examined them, forcing them to admit that they did not see the fight start and did not hear me threaten Jacob. They could not even categorically state that Mr. Sanders did not throw the first punch. Jacob was then called to the stand where he told his story. Naturally, Jacob gave a very detailed account of what was described as an unprovoked attack. Jacob emphatically stated that he did not throw any punches and then listed the injuries he sustained. My lawyer questioned him about his relationship with my wife. Jacob lied and said they were just friends. When asked about the baby my wife was carrying, he told the judge that as far as he knew, it was mine. When Jacob left the room, he smirked, returning to his seat. I was the only witness the lawyer called for my defense. And all he did was ask me to describe what happened that day, what led up to the alleged assault, and what I remembered about the incident. I described how my wife had blindsided me that morning by informing me that she was divorcing me to marry my boss. I was particularly devastated when my wife told me that the child I thought was mine was actually Jacob's. I explained that she was the love of my life, but had discarded me like a pair of old shoes. I told the judge that I remembered seeing Jacob at the door and how he smirked at me. After that, I lied and said I didn't remember anything until I was at my desk and started putting things in a box. The prosecutor tried to confuse me about my memories. He kept trying to revise the chronology of events. The truth was that I was so furious that morning that I had no idea of the time. And the more he questioned me and tried to get me to name specific times and actions, the more obvious it became that I didn't remember anything. Then he asked me if I really thought the court would believe that I, oddly enough, didn't remember anything about the assault. I told him that on the way to work I had a headache and saw flashes of light, which was actually true. I repeated that I only remembered Jacob smirking at me. He then asked me if I knew for sure that the baby my wife was carrying was Jacob's. 
I replied that I could only tell him what my wife said. Carol was not in court as no one bothered to subpoena her. My attorney told me that in his opinion, my wife was a wild card that he didn't want to touch. I assume the prosecutor felt the same way. After I left, the judge retired to his chambers to consider the verdict, but returned 10 minutes later. It is quite obvious to me, said Judge Parker, that Mr. Arnold has been betrayed in a most cowardly and disgraceful manner. I believe that this blow to his nervous system has resulted in serious mental disturbance. I believe that Mr. Arnold was temporarily insane, and I therefore find him not guilty. This is outrageous, roared Jacob from his seat, causing Judge Parker to lower the gavel sharply, threatening to hold Jacob in contempt. The sight of Jacob with his face red with anger pleased me. Jacob's victory over me had just been a little tainted, and yet I wanted revenge on him so badly. However, having just escaped imprisonment, I had to put any thoughts of revenge aside for the foreseeable future. Besides, I had no idea how to strike back at them. Outside the courtroom, Jacob was waiting for me. I thought about inciting him to attack me, but I wasn't sure how that would turn out, so I just called the bailiff. I'm not supposed to be within 500 feet of this man, but he's preventing me from leaving. The bailiff looked at Jacob and told him to move on. Jacob shouted over his shoulder, This isn't over! I'm going to sue you. This worried me, so I asked my attorney, Can he sue me? Anyone can sue anyone else, he said with a smile. But his case is weak. But if you really want to knock his legs out from under him, admit to nothing more than offering to pay his medical expenses that were not covered by insurance. That's exactly what I did in a letter sent to his office. Jacob did not respond and did not file a lawsuit. The night after the trial, it had been a little over nine weeks since Carol had dropped the bombshell on me. Although I was still seething with hatred, the court victory had lifted my spirits a little, and I decided to take Kimberly out to dinner. Besides, I had some exciting news I wanted to share with her. Now let me dissuade any readers who think my story will follow the usual scenario. I have read many similar stories about husbands who have been betrayed, just like me. In these stories, it seems that all the abused husbands start their own businesses. Then the cheating husband becomes fabulously wealthy, and his ex-wife realizes she made a huge mistake in leaving him. That's never gonna happen to me. I'm just a worker bee. I'm a good worker bee, but I'm just a worker bee. Kimberly and I agreed to meet at a small Italian restaurant. She had to work a little later that night because things weren't going well in my former department. Nothing serious, they were just adjusting to my absence. Anyway, when she came in, she looked great. Kimberly was still busty, but it was obvious she had lost weight, and the dress she wore really suited her. I stood up and kissed her cheek. Wow, you look beautiful. You've lost weight, haven't you? Kimberly brightened. Yes, I've lost 16 pounds. I'm sorry I didn't notice before, but you're wearing those sweatshirts and oversized pants. Anyway, like I said, you look great. The restaurant was small and intimate. It was exactly the kind of place couples choose for a date. But I didn't think of it as a date. It was just a meeting of two close friends. I asked you to have dinner with me tonight because I wanted to celebrate my court victory, and I have news. I found a job. That's great, Kimberly cheered. Who are you going to work for? Sable Security out of Jacksonville, Florida, I replied. I didn't know they had an office here, Kimberly said uneasily. No, I'll have to move to Jacksonville. I was completely surprised when the light went out in Kimberly's eyes and tears rolled down her cheeks. I thought you'd be happy for me, I said, embarrassed. I'm happy you found a job, Kimberly said as the tears continued to flow. But you'll be 600 miles away. Kimberly, remember when you told me not to let my wife's betrayal consume me with hatred? She nodded. I realize now that the only way to do this is to put some distance between Carol and me and let time do the rest. I understand, Kimberly said, wiping her eyes. It's just that I'm going to miss you. It was really nice having a friend. Hey, I'm only a phone call away, I said, trying unsuccessfully to cheer her up. I was genuinely surprised by Kimberly's reaction. Then it occurred to me that she probably didn't have many friends, so I offered another suggestion. You can come visit us if you want. I don't know what Jacksonville has to offer, but I'll find out. Do you really want me to come to you? She asked. Of course, I said quickly. 
Remember that I won't have any friends there either. When are you leaving? asked Kimberly finally. I won't start until 45 days from now, but I have a lot to catch up on before then. I have to find a place to live, open a new checking account at a bank here. I also have to pass a lie detector test, get fingerprinted. I think it will take me at least two trips there to do all that. The mood improved a little after that, but I noticed that Kimberly hadn't eaten much of anything. I figured she was still a little upset. In fact, the closer it got to the time when I had to leave, I noticed that Kimberly was getting sadder every day. It seemed like she was hoping that there would be something more between us. Admittedly, this confused me because I felt that Kimberly could accomplish so much more than I could. I spent the last night before I left for my new job at Kimberly's apartment. She had made a delicious dinner, complete with a chocolate cake that said, I'll miss you. After I helped her clean up, we watched TV until it was time to go to bed. I kissed her on the lips before heading to the guest room. One night I felt the bed shift slightly and a body appeared next to me. I was still half asleep when I realized it was Kimberly. I froze for a second as she reached down. And we made love. When I was done, I pressed myself against Kimberly and she sobbed. I worried that maybe I'd hurt her, or she was angry that I'd taken advantage of her or something else. What's wrong, Kimberly? I asked almost in a panic. Did I hurt you? No, I'm just so happy, Kimberly said, resting her head on my chest. I've had sex with five or six men before, but this is the first time I've made love. Thank you. We lay like that for several long minutes before Kimberly slid off my bed. She took two steps toward the door and then came back to me. She leaned over and kissed me. Are you going to sleep in my bed with me tonight? I gladly agreed, if only because my bed was soaking wet. Besides, being in bed with Kimberly seemed like the perfect way to spend my last night in this city. The next morning it was the same. We did it again. After breakfast, I checked my car one last time to make sure I had everything. I then turned to Kimberly and gave her a kiss. Then, unfortunately, it was time for me to leave. As the car pulled away, I looked in the rearview mirror and saw Kimberly crouched on the curb. She had her head buried in her hands and was sobbing. I desperately hated to leave her, but I knew it was for the best. I still loved Carol, which meant I was damaged goods. It was even funny because I wasn't thinking about revenge anymore. I just had a deep sadness in the back of my mind. Jacksonville was an interesting city, but I didn't get to see much of it. I plunged headlong into my new job. I worked long hours, but not just to catch up, but because it helped me forget about Carol. I kept in touch with Kimberly, and she always seemed so happy when she heard from me and so sad when our phone conversation ended. It was from her that I heard the news I had been dreading. Carol and Jacob were married about a month after the divorce was finalized. I also learned that Carol had a baby girl. For some reason, this news didn't excite me as much. Maybe I was beginning to get over the resentment and humiliation. True, I no longer had sleepless nights. I also rarely woke up in the morning depressed that Carol wasn't in bed with me. Kimberly came and spent four days with me in March. Since we hadn't seen each other for a while, we weren't sure about our relationship. We kind of danced around the issue of sex and didn't sleep together until the last two nights. It was almost as intense as that first time. About a year after that, I was told I could hire an administrative assistant for my team. Sable Security was much larger than my previous company. Whereas Zaba had one cybersecurity team, we had six. And over the course of that year, I went from being just a member of one team to being a team leader. Since the decision on who to hire was up to me, I called Kimberly right away. I barely had time to explain the job to her before she said she wanted it. When I met Kimberly at the airport, it took my breath away. As I suspected, she was gorgeous. When she stepped out of the cabin, I could see she was out of breath, but all she wanted to do was get to me. She threw herself into my arms and kissed me with a passion that made my knees go weak. The plan was for Kimberly to stay with me until she found her own apartment. I figured it would only take a week, but the search dragged on for a week. Every apartment she looked at had something wrong with it. I didn't complain because Kimberly and I slept in the same bed. The funny thing is, in the year and a half I lived in Jacksonville, I thought of Carol less and less often. And when Kimberly arrived, I stopped thinking about her altogether. However, I knew that Kimberly would eventually move out, and I dreaded that day. Five weeks later, I asked Kimberly about the apartment situation and she cried. I was completely dumbfounded. I knew I had brought her to tears, but I sure as hell didn't understand why. I'm sorry, I apologized. Did I say something wrong? 
Do you want me to leave? Asked Kimberly timidly. Hell no, I said firmly. I'd like you to stay for good, but I know you'll want to leave one day. I need time to prepare. I'd ask you to marry me, but you're too good for me. No, I don't, Kimberly protested. I've loved you almost since the day I started working at Zaba's. I'd marry you in a heartbeat. That changed everything for us. That same day we went to the store to get a ring and started planning our wedding. Even though I was afraid that Kimberly would eventually leave me for someone else, I was so in love with her that I had to take the risk. Six months later, Kimberly and I were married. A year after that, Kimberly gave birth to a little boy we named Mikey Jr. 18 months after that, we had a baby girl we named Charlotte. I had risen at Sable to head all eight cybersecurity teams. Yes, we added two more. Kimberly, on the other hand, chose to become a stay-at-home mom. Close to Christmas, three years later, I was called to a meeting. At that meeting, I learned that Sable was planning to acquire Zaba security software. I was to be part of a team that would conduct due diligence before the acquisition was finalized. During the years that Kimberly and I were married, Kimberly's mother passed away and my parents retired. They moved to Jacksonville to be closer to their grandchildren and me. By babysitting them, I planned to use the week-long trip as a mini vacation. In addition, I would utilize Kimberly's skills as an administrative assistant to help her investigate. That way, I would be able to take Kimberly to work every day where she could see the people she worked with and we could sneak away for long lunches together. In the course of my week in Nashville, I learned four things. First, I learned that the facility was the only place where Zaba was involved in cybersecurity. Second, Jacob was named COO and Carol was named Senior Project Manager. Third, despite my hostility to Jacob, I found that he was running a tight ship. From my perspective, his entire operation was first class. And the last thing I learned was that the Zaba was having a Christmas party on Friday night and I had to go to it. Other than our team's first introduction to Jacob, I had no contact with him. In addition, I hadn't seen Carol once all week. However, that all changed at the Christmas party. Zaba rented a ballroom at the Hilton Doubletree Hotel in downtown Nashville. It was festively decorated, with tables lining the perimeter of the dance floor and a five-piece band perched in one corner. They quietly played Christmas carols, soft background music, and occasionally included old songs. After dinner and speeches, the dancing was to begin. In addition, to everyone's delight, the bar was opened. As more people arrived, it attracted more and more attention. Jacob, Carol, and some of the senior officers from Zaba did not fail to greet the Sable crew. I wasn't looking forward to it. I didn't know how I would react to having to face Jacob and Carol. However, my fears were in vain. Jacob, as I already knew, looked about the same, and Carol, though looking a little older, was still doing well. Strangely, I didn't feel anything when they came over to greet us. Mike, I'm glad you could join us tonight. Jacob said nervously. I hope our past differences won't interfere with the acquisition. Not from me, I assured him. It's ancient history. And who is this cutie? Jacob smiled broadly, taking Kimberly's hand. This is my favorite wife, Kimberly, I said, kissing her on the cheek. Jacob's smile evaporated as he looked at Kimberly and then at me. Kimberly smirked at Jacob. Don't you remember me, Jacob? I was Michael's administrative assistant when he worked for Zaba. But I changed jobs and became Michael's wife. That was a big promotion for me. Jacob's eyes narrowed further, but he tried to smile again. It didn't look genuine, however. Of course, it's been so long. I'm sorry I didn't recognize you. Jacob stepped back, but his gaze continued to roam over Kimberly and me. Then Carol moved toward me. Michael, you look really good, she said, taking my hand. And your wife is gorgeous. I didn't know you were married. We'll have been married seven years in March, Kimberly said with a smile as she hugged my arm. Both you and Jacob look good, I replied, and then asked. How's your daughter doing? Carol wrinkled her nose at first, but then smiled. She's doing great. Tammy is in second grade and her brother, Jacob Jr., is in kindergarten. Do you have kids? Two, Kimberly replied. Mickey Jr. goes to daycare and Charlotte is still at home with me. They're doing well. Thanks for asking. Carol moved on and shortly thereafter, Kimberly and I went to find our table. The food was excellent and the speeches were thankfully short. 
The Sable CEO simply assured everyone that no one's job was in jeopardy for at least the next year and that he was looking forward to the merger. When dinner was over, the music started playing and Kimberly and I did a few laps around the floor. I don't think today's kids know how to dance. A slow dance with a loved one is such an intimate thing. It can connect two people almost as much as sex. One evening, I felt a tap on my shoulder. Turning around, I found Carol standing there. Kimberly turned to see who I was looking at, and her eyes narrowed when she realized it was my ex-wife. Carol smiled sweetly at Kimberly. May I ask your husband to dance? Kimberly looked at me and then smiled at Carol. Just so long as you don't forget where to return it. I led Carol out onto the dance floor, and for about a minute, we danced in silence. Michael, I just want to apologize to you for what Jacob and I did to you back then, she said with genuine remorse in her voice. You didn't deserve any of it. But when I found out I was pregnant with Jacob's baby, I knew it was over between us. I decided to make our breakup quick and easy. I didn't even think about how much it would hurt you. I shouldn't have let Jacob talk me into the scorched earth policy we used. It was completely inappropriate. I chuckled slightly. As people say, it's either water under the bridge or water over the dam. It doesn't matter right now. We've all moved on. Besides, I kind of earned some of it. I beat the shit out of Jacob. Apparently, I didn't do much damage to his testicles because you got a second kid. Carol giggled at that. We danced in silence for a while, and I decided to bury the hatchet between us once and for all. Listen, Carol, I began hesitantly. I admit that I was very bitter when you left me for Jacob. It took many months to come to terms with your loss, but now we are both happily married and have children. I've come to believe that it was meant to be. Carol broke into a harsh laugh, and when I looked at her face, a tear ran down her cheek. Did I say something wrong? Carol only shook her head. No, Michael, you didn't say anything wrong. It's just not what you think. At first glance, everyone thinks we're the perfect couple. And for the first year, I would have agreed with them. But Jacob is a charming manipulator. He uses people and then dumps them. I know he's cheated on me many times, but he's not as smart as he thinks he is. Every time I find out he's cheating on me, I cheat on him. My mouth dropped open and Carol noticed. She giggled. It's a damn bad way to live, I know, she said sadly. I should have left Jacob when I found out what he was really like, but I was too ashamed and too proud. Michael, I'm glad you found happiness, but I will always regret leaving you. You and my children are the best thing that ever happened to me. We continued talking until the song ended. Then Carol walked me back to my table and thanked Kimberly for letting her borrow me. As Kimberly and I danced our last dance of the evening, it dawned on me that her advice all those years ago had proven to be correct. If I had refused to move on from Carol, she might well have swallowed me up. I guess it's true what they say. When God closes a door, he opens another. When I lost Carol, I was completely devastated, but then God allowed me to find Kimberly. And I can't even imagine life without her. So what did you and Carol talk about? Kimberly finally asked. Is she trying to get you back? I laughed and kissed her. Like she has any chance of doing that. Okay, Kimberly said, resting her head on my shoulder. Just remember that I'm a jealous woman. I'll cut you off you know what if you try to leave me. I only brought it up because I heard that things aren't all bright and sunny in their marriage. Carol told me the same thing, I agreed, but I think they'll stay together for the sake of the kids. After the kids are grown, I wouldn't bet on this marriage surviving. What a sad way to go through life. Anyway, Carol told me something that I thought was funny. I know it didn't amuse her in the least, and I'm sure Jacob won't find it amusing when they get home tonight. What's that? Carol stood behind her husband's back and he didn't even notice her presence. Jacob stared at you as he said, that damn Michael won again. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.